Pilgrim is dead now and never faced police charges. It's the same pattern I'm seeing time and time again. Schools getting rid of the teacher, doing nothing to stop them abusing somewhere else. But for the children, entire lives can be contaminated. Decades on, we found more evidence of abuse at St Albans. Same school, different teacher. I've been contacted by the sister of another more recent St Albans student. His story shows the damage that can be done. Gavin Purchase arrived there in 1987, aged eight. He took his own life a couple of years ago at 37 years old. His sister Rachel has kept the suicide note he left behind. Dear mum, you are probably the reason I have lasted so long and achieved so much, but I am living a nightmare. Six breakdowns before the age A popular, of successful man, his letter blamed the decision to end his life on sexual abuse he said he'd been subjected to at school. We will always be with you. Love your boy, Gavin. For most of his life, Gavin hadn't spoken of his alleged abuse. It was only a few years before his death, after struggling with depression, that Gavin opened up to his family. He told them that for two years at St Albans, he'd been sexually abused by this man, his maths teacher, Geoffrey Nichols. It was under the guise of being given extra lessons and that it happened twice a week. In fact, he hadn't wanted to tell us. I think he thought he should. And then afterwards, he said he wished he hadn't said anything because he knew that all it would do is just make us all feel bad and he didn't want us to feel bad. I wish that I had gone and taken him out of there. Not long after Gavin killed himself, Rachel discovered that three years after Gavin had left St Albans, Nichols was jailed for sexually abusing two other boys at the school. I then wondered, did no one really think it was odd that a teacher would take small boys to his room? Was it just something that people didn't, they really didn't have any awareness of the kind of thing that would go on? In the final year of his life, Gavin moved back home so his mother could look after him. Hello, Hello darling. How are you doing? Hi, Wiggly. Come on, come in, silly dog. Here you come. His room is now a collection of his most precious belongings. The pain of Gavin's death is still raw, but just as intense as the family's anger at his alleged abuser now long out of prison. I feel that he murdered my son, but I don't suppose he looks at it that way. If I could turn the clock back, I would never send him away. The anger uh, at what has happened is not just at myself for putting him in school, but is to put him in a school where he wasn't safe and this man could do these things to him with impunity. We contacted Geoffrey Nichols and he categorically denied Gavin's allegations. St Albans closed in 2013, but the Cothill Trust, which owns the school, told us it was under their stewardship for less than a year. But the historic allegations from the 1970s and 1990s are utterly deplorable. But these failures weren't only at school level. I've discovered this goes a lot higher to the very organisations that were meant to ensure high standards. In my research into boarding schools, I've seen many instances where schools failed to act on allegations of abuse. But among the hundreds of cases, one stood out. It was one of the country's top prep schools, and here the abuser wasn't just a lowly teacher, it was the owner and headmaster, Robin Lindsay, whose abuse spanned three decades, from the 1970s until the end of the 1990s. The school was Sherburn Prep in Dorset. 
Sherbin Prep is a fascinating case, and not least because this man, dismissed as a harmless eccentric, turns out to be a serious abuser while running that school. And for a child there, th this is the authority figure. There are no governors, no trustees. So where does a child go? Eventually, concerns over his behavior became so extreme, the Department for Education held a tribunal in 1998. Its ruling called Lindsay a fixated paedophile and he was barred from teaching. Just months from retiring anyway, he never faced police charges. So many questions about this place. In it, how did he manage to go on running this school, looking after children for so long when so many questions were raised about him? A, three Sherburn Prep survivors from the 70s are meeting up for the very first time to compare memories of their old headmaster. I always remember the wash between the buttocks thing in the showers. Do you, did you have that when he used to stand there and go yeah, wash between yeah, the buttocks? Yeah, he, he, wa he, he yeah. washed always a shower there. every day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can remember showers would sometimes sort of happen two, three times a day, you know, there'd be, uh, and he would always be there. My little, littlest brother, you know, was there in the 80s where he used to feel the genitals of the rugby team at the time. He jumped into bed. I mean, he was just going crazy. If you got injured or any risk of it, he would be there rubbing embrication onto any part of your body. It was the one time when I ended up on his, uh, his own bed, in his bedroom, stripped. Uh, and to this day, I've got this image of him with flaring nostrils, uh, staring at my groin, rubbing it. Uh, and I was just frozen there in, in fear. And that, that, I get that image every day. For Gilo, his worst memories are what happened to him as a 10-year-old after lights out. He'd come and stand in the middle of the dorm mm. uh, for a long five, what felt yeah. like five, ten minutes, to check that everybody was asleep. Yeah. You could tell that he was around yeah. at night because of the, the fug that kind of... The smell of yeah. um, just revolting tobacco. Oh, God, you, you were yeah. aware of his presence mm. and uh, the, the back rub thing would start and I still remember very very powerfully and distinctly when that back rub became um, him masturbating over me. I didn't understand what was going on but I knew that I was being held down with one hand that he told me not to turn around and that became a pattern for the next year. Did any of you at the time attempt to tell your parents? I did try and tell my mother, and she says, oh, no, no, it can't possibly be. No, 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 no. And, then, and then that was it. She just dismissed it? Yeah, dismissed, so it wasn't, it wasn't happening. Incredibly, it was another two decades before the Independent Schools Tribunal into Sherburn Prep finally forced Lindsay out in 1998. You must feel angry on behalf of those children who came after you. I feel sad that for three decades that went unchecked. When he, he was retired or there was 700 people in this service in the Abbey mm. gave him um, uh, three cheers. Even today there are people who believe that he's maligned. I think he kind of slipped justice, um, uh, really. He, he got off light, you know, he got off light. It's, it's just bloody scandalous, really. We've discovered that the opportunity to stop Lindsay first arose 14 years before the authorities acted. In 1985, a whistleblowing teacher from Sherburn Prep went to IAPS, the Association of Prep Schools. A school's membership of this umbrella group was meant to be a guarantee of high standards. They investigated and said he'd behaved foolishly and indiscreetly. But according to the later tribunal ruling, did not take strong or effective action against him. It seems shockingly complacent, so I took a closer look at who sat on the IAPS board back then, and I realized two of the headmasters on there were already known to me, including its chairman, Robin Peverett. They were absolutely the wrong men to be looking into abuse at a prep school. There's Robin Peverett, later convicted of sexually abusing his own pupils, and there's Robin Lindsay himself. It's extraordinary. Despite the serious allegations against him, Lindsay remained on the IAPS board for another two years. 
And it was another eight years before inspectors again visited the school, this time from Dorset Social Services. Our Freedom of Information request revealed a report with a catalogue of paedophilic behaviour. Children complaining of Lindsay's supervised showers, his interest in watching their naked bodies, close hugs with the stench of cigar smoke. Most incredibly was the account of one boy who claimed he was sexually molested by an intruder wearing a wig and stinking of cigars. The headmaster told him it must have been a dream. Robin Lindsay died in 2016. We've managed to track down one of the few people who can explain why he never faced police charges. Jill Donnell was the chief superintendent at Dorset Police and she oversaw the investigation into him in 1993. I remembered this case over the many, many cases, over the many, many years I've worked in the police all the challenges that we had getting the evidence that's necessary. And in the case that we're talking about, the main place that evidence is going to come from is from small children. And what was the reaction of the parents when you went to try and talk to these children? I'm sad to say that the majority that I spoke to were uh, very hesitant and some, some of them very, very clear they were not going to let us talk to the children. And it was said to me on more than one occasion that the most important thing for the parents was that their children went to the required public school and that anything that was done to uh, endanger that, they weren't terribly supportive of at all. So their careers, their academic careers were more important yes. than their safety? Yes, their priority was about their the future of their children and not was what may or may not have been happening to them at that time. Sherburn Preparatory School told us they have sympathy for any victims and said it takes the welfare of current and former pupils very seriously. But as they bought the school from Lindsay in 1998, it is now an entirely different legal, financial and governance entity. It is therefore unable to comment on any of the issues raised. On their failure to take effective action against Lindsay, IAPS, the independent association of prep schools, simply told us they are appalled by the events of the past. Today, the education, care and welfare of young people is their primary concern, and they demand the most exacting standards of themselves and their schools. As a journalist and as a survivor, I know the lifelong damage abuse can cause. But as an adult, I've never looked an offender in the eyes and asked them why. Today, I'm on my way to meet James, a former prep school teacher and a paedophile. The teacher who sexually assaulted me is dead, so now I'm, I'm never going to get the chance to ask the questions I want to ask. But there are questions, there are universal questions I need to ask for me and, and for the thousands of people like me who, who were abused. James has served time in prison for sexual assaults on children in the 70s and 80s. His views are shocking, but shed light on the culture that allowed sexual abuse to become almost accepted. I was sexually abused by not one master, but by five when I was at prep school. It, didn't, it never done me any harm. They made my life so much more pleasant in various ways that I accepted it. I was getting something from them that I wasn't getting from my parents. Uh, dinky toys, cigarette cards, whole sets, and the love and affection which I was deprived of at home. When, when you got the job, uh, with background checks done on you? None whatsoever, no. And that was normal at the time? Yes, yeah. And when you arrived there, um, were you aware that there was unorthodox relationships between the teachers and the boys? At least two of my predecessors had been dismissed for um, intimacy with the boys, shall we say. And then after about the first year, um, I learned that the deputy headmaster uh, was also intimately involved with a number of boys. And, and when you say an intimate relationship, it, what does that mean? It, it's a, a simple case of a master literally falling in love with an attractive boy. I find this very hard to hear. 
and I'm particularly horrified to discover he believes his first victim had actually wanted to be abused. It was the boy that instigated the actual um, intimacy. Uh, he approached me one day and um, su suggested that I did something to him. Simple as that. And that's not unusual. That was to perform a sexual act? Yes. Yeah. The initial boy we, we, we've been speaking about was uh, 10 years old, 11 years old, I think? He was, uh, well, he was nearly 12. He was nearly 12. Yeah. Um, do you feel he gave consent? Yes. How, how can one know that with, with someone that age? <laughs> Good question. A 12-year-old boy is just as capable of giving consent as any other age. For a survivor like me, it's upsetting to hear a paedophile convince himself that his victim can be complicit. It is one of the cruelest and most damaging aspects of abuse. Do you think what you've described is still going on in boarding schools today? My guess is that yes, it is. Because it is traditional. I know you won't like that word, but it is traditional. It has been going on for generations. Our evidence suggests it would be naive to believe boarding schools no longer hold appeal for predatory paedophiles. Our freedom of information request to every police force revealed that since 2012, at least 125 people have been accused by children of recent sex attacks at boarding schools. And there are at least 31 ongoing investigations. So it's vital schools today take their duty to protect children seriously. But many say there's still confusion over what schools must do if they suspect abuse. The government tells schools they should report abuse allegations to their local authority. So we also made an FOI request to every local authority in England and Wales and found that since 2012, 404 allegations of sexual abuse were reported by boarding schools. But there were glaring differences in reporting figures. One council responsible for 19 boarding schools had received 60 complaints. Another, with 20, just two. Perhaps that's down to one startling fact, that schools in the UK are still not legally obliged to tell the authorities. Caldercut School in Buckinghamshire saw several of its former teachers convicted for abuse in the 1970s. Tom Perry was the first complainant in the scandal and now campaigns for the reporting of abuse to be made legally mandatory. Do you think things are genuinely different at the boarding schools nowadays? Um, I don't see how they can be. Um, in simple terms, when I was abused and when you were abused, uh, there was no requirement to report abuse. Today, there is no requirement to report abuse. If you can spot a difference in there somewhere, let me know. But the current rules, the statutory guidance, say you should report suspicion yes. of a known or sus suspected abuse. Is that not enough? <laughs> yeah, but look, I should lose weight. I should drink less. But there's no one to hold me to account for it. And it's exactly the same in child protection in these settings. I mean, the whole thing is absurd. I showed Tom the results of our FOI request. Could the lack of a clear legal requirement explain the vastly different reporting rates to the local authorities? It doesn't add up. Um, it could be lack of referrals. It could be schools just saying, no, 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 we'll, just, we'll deal with this. We'll deal with this in-house. Of course, all schools are expected to have sufficient safeguarding arrangements to prevent abuse in the first place. These are checked in regular inspections. We've looked at the most recent inspection report for every boarding school in England. Depending on the rating system used by each different inspectorate, when it came to safeguarding, one in 10 schools either failed to meet national standards or else didn't meet the requirements needed to be given a rating of good. So what is the industry today doing to protect children? Are cases being referred to the authorities? And why have so few schools publicly apologized to survivors?
Today I'm meeting with the Boarding Schools Association, which represents 90% of boarding schools. Can you, hand on your heart, say that the grotesque failures and abuses that we saw really not very long ago are impossible today? What I can say is that everyone who works in boarding today is professional, caring and doing everything they can to make safeguarding their number one priority. There's no doubt um, that, a, that there was a period where some people at some schools experienced some appalling abuse and it's absolutely shocking. But in, in my experience, there isn't, there isn't any school out there which you know, doesn't want to listen to victims and where it can, as quickly as possible, say sorry. Organizations like the NSPCC, IAPS, and the Independent Schools Council have told us they too support mandatory reporting for boarding schools. We asked the government about this. They declined an interview, but said that in 2016 they held a public consultation about whether it should be introduced, and they will publish its finding in due course. But how long can we wait while abuse and grooming still goes on in schools? I've been contacted by Matthew, who only left school this decade. As a teenager, he boarded at one of Britain's most prestigious institutions and was sexually assaulted by a teaching assistant away from school premises. I went back to school the next term and I told him that I didn't want him to contact me. And like a boomerang, he came back into my life. He told me that if I told anyone about this case, then they would just say that I was gay to everyone in the school. And he just got increasingly controlling over being in aspects of my life. And what kind of things was he doing? So he was taking me out to restaurants. He got to know my friends through kind of social media. I had over 120 mutual friends with him on Facebook by the time I'd left the school. There were instances when he got me to go back to his, like, flat, and I was just there by myself. So he would in invite you back to his room at the school. I mean, was that normal for teachers at the school? Could they do that to, to children? Not on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The rules were, for some reason, didn't seem to apply to him. How obvious was his behaviour? Retrospectively, it seems really obvious. His abuser's behaviour clearly broke the school's own safeguarding policies, but his actions seemed to have gone unnoticed. They even promoted the man to become a teacher. Did you ever think of telling anyone at the school? There genuinely was not anyone who was suitable at the school for me to tell. First of all, I wasn't really sure about the procedure that would be involved. I didn't know whether I would have to be to leave the school. I didn't know whether teachers would believe me. Matthew went to the police a couple of years after he left the school. His abuser has been jailed. Do you blame the school for what happened? In terms of the incident of sexual assault, I don't blame the school. But in terms of the grooming, the school was complicit. Matthew's school was inspected six months after his teacher was arrested. It was given a rating of excellent for safeguarding, so parents of pupils would have no way of knowing there had been allegations of a breach at the school. People say that these kind of things could never happen in a school today. Do you agree with that? People are very happy to pat themselves on the back when this is labelled as historic or it wasn't under this leadership at the school and things have changed. And I think that that mentality diverts the attention away from thinking dynamically about how abuse can exist in the 21st century. It's been four years since I first wrote about my time at Ashton House. Today, I was meant to meet with its owners to hear how things have changed. In the end, they decided against the interview, but said I could still visit my old school. Coming back to Ashton doesn't feel good. I spent five of the formative, most miserable years of my life here, and it's, it's somewhere that still appears in nightmares. My school, like so many others, has never formally apologised for what happened to us under their care. Keen to distance themselves from these abuses of the past. Perhaps that is part of the problem. 
Because if we never truly acknowledge our mistakes, how can we learn from them? Since I first wrote about the abuse at this school and many others, I've heard so many stories of misery, of, of real horror. And it was chiefly because they didn't listen to me, to my friends, to all those school children then. And I really hope now that this story is historical, that children are being listened to today. Because if they're not, then these same crimes can be committed with impunity. We have to listen to children. It's the only answer.